Hi guys, it's John. Um, another Tuesday, another book review, another day. Uh, certainly not another dollar in my AdSense account, but a book review nonetheless. And one for people, hopefully, that will be a bit of a treat for anyone who likes philosophy. Today is um, a little book about Socrates, specifically the, uh, the Trial of Socrates by I.F. Stone. Um, so just a little word about I.F. Stone. He was, in the 50s and 60s, a big-time American journalist, and um, mostly a sort of a left-wing journalist, but also known for his civil libertarianism. And for about 20 years in the 50s and 60s, he put out uh, a publication called I.F. Stone's Weekly. And after about 20 years, he had to retire due to his health. And after he retired, he indulged his interest in history, including learning Greek. And he got interested in the Greek classics and eventually fell on the topic of Socrates, which... Um, well, the, the, the topic of uh, Plato's dialogues and met Socrates through those, I guess, for a second or third time, knowing him, and really sort of fell in love with him. It wasn't purely a love relationship, but became fascinated with him as a person. Uh, as a culture, we tend to take the accusations made towards Socrates to be sort of foregone conclusions, and his forced execution to be the result of an Athens that was too entrenched in its own power to handle a heavy dose of philosophical medicine. Today, Socrates' reputation seems to precede him as someone who eschewed any interest in the political and searched only after the good, the beautiful, and the true, those platonic ideals. Whether this is just the whitewashed history of his most dutiful and most talented student, Plato, is an interesting and important question. In the trial of Socrates, I. F. Stone, the civil libertarian and journalist whose fascination with the early Greeks grew to such an extent after his retirement that he actually taught himself Greek, like I said, in order to read the original documents that were pertinent to the book, earnestly attempts to dig back into the original sources and materials and dialogues and, and try to construct a, a coherent um, line of thought about what was going on in the trial. He goes back to Plato, uh, Xenophon, but also the major tragedi tragedians of the 4th and 5th century, uh, Aeschylus, uh, Sophocles, and Euripides, in order to sort of make create the story that's probably not too familiar with most casual readers of philosophy. If you are familiar with Socrates or Plato, you probably know this already, but it's that Socrates basically has this disdain for Athenian democracy that, you know, in the 4th century, in 4th century Athens, democracy was ascendant, it was well established, and here is this guy who <laughs> um, basically thinks that we need philosopher kings to rule ourselves, which is very much against the entire ethos of what Athens was all about at the time. The book is split into two parts, with the first part exploring a few fundamental ways in which Socrates disagreed with most of his fellow Athenians about human nature. So um, Socrates, like I said, um, if you are familiar with him, especially through the Platonic dialogues, you know him to be a fairly anti-democratic, uh, anti-populist uh, person. I mean, he's he doesn't really believe in the average person's ability to do much of anything. He thinks, <clears throat> in fact, he explicitly makes uh, a few times uh, the comparison between people and sheep, suggesting that people need a shepherd uh, 
in order to keep them from going astray. Whereas obviously the prevailing 4th century idea in Athens at the time is a democratic one where people are able to govern themselves. As a result of Socrates' view, uh, it, may become, it may become as no surprise that he chooses to withdraw from Athenian public life and spend his leisure time philosophizing with and otherwise engaging the attention of beautiful young boys. But after all, if you reject the idea of humans as Aristotelian zoon politikon, and you see them only as disembodied rationalities absolved from all social obligations and, and responsibility, you have every reason to throw off the duties of citizenship and submit yourself to the sublimity of the platonic forms. Referring to Socrates as a gadfly, that old saying, the platonic gadfly, uh, has stuck not because of his rampant, thoroughgoing skepticism and his willingness to use it against those in power, but instead because of his peculiar means of philosophical interrogation. And this is something interesting that I'll, as I'll point out, I always had suspicions about too, but Stone really sort of gets to the point when he when he mentions it. If you go back and you read Plato's dialogues, Socrates always asks his interlocutors how they would define the subject of conversation, whether it's beauty or truth or virtue or whatever else. If they are unable to do this, and of course they almost always are, Socrates condescendingly dismisses them and says that they can't possibly even define their terms and engaging in any conversation would just be fruitless because you don't you can't even define what you're talking about. College students everywhere read this, read it, and continue to read it as a sort of myutic triumph of sorts. How, after all, can you talk about virtue when you can't even define it for yourself? However, this is obviously just a bit of, at least I think it is, a bit of casuistic rhetoric and a rather I ironic bit of casuistic rhetoric for someone who always claimed to denounce the sophists. Obviously, we can recognize and distinguish between the behavior of a virtuous person and a nefarious one, even if we can't provide an airtight definition of virtue or nefariousness. The second section of the book addresses the trial itself, <clears throat> which I found to be somewhat less interesting, but it, it's still interesting. And um, he, one of the, 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 the points that he makes in the second half of the book is that Socrates was really highly antagonistic towards the jury during his trial. So antagonistic and sarcastic, in fact, that Stone thinks he was actually trying to be found guilty and be executed. But, uh, of course, Socrates famously did not really want to craft a really good defense of his own actions during the trial. And Stone thinks that's because if he would have done that, he would have sort of given in to the entire um, sort of Potemkin village, I guess uh, Socrates might have called it, of Athenian democracy itself. He just thought that the whole thing was a sham. Of course, trial by jury is a sham. You know, I mean, whatever the majority of the people say is, is going to, you know, end up finding you guilty or not guilty. And the majority of people uh, of any given group have no idea what they're talking about, according to him. So he's he 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 just he just wants to die instead of mounting his own defense. This book, along with Karl Popper's, which I'll mention more of in a little bit, Karl Popper's The Open Society and Its Enemies, did a really good job in validating some of the ideas that I first had when I was first exposed to Socrates. Whenever you are first exposed to Socrates in, I guess what you could call, call an institutional setting, like a university, um, freshman seminar, uh, philosophy seminar, I'm guessing, for many of us in the United States, uh, 
it's almost always in a state of unalloyed reverence and allegiance to philosophy, uh, to, to Socrates as this seeker of truth. There's something about his relentless skepticism and his willingness to take down the most cocksure of his opponents that makes readers want to pat him on the back and root him on. But I found myself thinking, and this was long before I was ever exposed to Popper, or I.F. Stone for that matter, who on earth would want to spend time around this snibbling, sanctimonious twit who can only destroy the ingenuous attempts at philosophy offered up by others, but can never creatively, positively construct any of his own? Socrates' negative dialectic always seemed to be, at least to me, the preeminent example of, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, baffle them with bullshit. There's one mistake, despite Stone's concerted efforts, he might be repeatedly making throughout the book, and that is the uncritical conflation of Socrates with Plato. Since Socrates himself wrote nothing, all we have of his opinions are conveyed second-hand through the dialogues of Plato and through Xenophon's memorabilia, which is the name of his, uh, con his own collected book of Socratic dialogues, which somehow never gets really read in philosophy classes. But Xenophon was another one of Socrates's maybe four to six most famous students, of course, with Plato being by far the most famous. Therefore, the only lenses that we can read Socrates through are those of students who thought him to be, despite his own warnings, to, to basically treat him just as a humble truth seeker, who basically saw him as a demigod. One virtue of Stone's thesis is that none of it was taken from a single text in isolation, and he seems to be really good with looking at a variety of texts. Like I said, he even goes back to the ancient tragedians and pulls lessons from them, looks at Plato, looks at Xenophon, looks at the, um, the uh, all of the sources together and tr really doesn't build a thesis on one particular isolated text, but reads them all in context with one another, and I think that sort of makes the argument a bit stronger. Uh, while Stone's account of Socrates' relationship with Athens is certainly not the only one that resides, uh, is certainly not the one that resides in the popular historical imagination, it's far from being untrodden ground. So in 1947, 40 years before Stone published The Trial of Socrates, the Austrian-British philosopher of science, Karl Popper, came out with volume one of The Open Society and Its Enemies, the first volume of which is a full-on attack of everything platonic, from Plato's metaphysics to his aesthetics to his political philosophy. And you may very well want to read Attack at, of Everything Platonic as Attack on Everything Socratic as well. Again, the conflation problem. While Stone makes no pretensions of scholarship, Popper was one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, undeniably. Uh, reading these two books together, The Trial of Socrates and, uh, and, and, and Popper, Especially Volume 1. There is a Volume 2 which focuses on Hegel and Marx, but that doesn't really have to concern uh, Plato. Reading the two in tandem, one comes away with a much clearer, well-rounded picture of not only the possible reasons Athenians might have wanted to take Socrates to task, but the reasons why they may very well have suspected his thought to be deeply anti-democratic, and some have gone so far as to suggest proto-fascistic, uh, the strains that inhere, uh, inhere in Plato's thought, Plato by Socrates. So, if any of that sounds fun, if you want your conventional ideas, uh, perhaps they are naive, perhaps they're not uh, naive, 
ideas of Socrates challenged or uh, opposed, this is a, a pretty interesting place to start. A, a very um, approachable, popularly written book, but not dumbed down. And then, if you like this, I would suggest going and reading Popper, which I think I'm going to uh, do rather soon and perhaps review on this channel for you. So, um, let me know what you think about it. Um, drop me a comment, and I will talk to you guys later. The Trial of Socrates by I.F. Stone. See you next Tuesday.